Assalamu alaikum. Mohammed Bona was just here, and I heard him try to get you guys to raise your voices. Well, I think you, you're on mute or silent. But it's, the topic we're talking about is Dawa. We got too much echo in this thing. The topic we're talking about is Dawa to multiply your deeds. And one of the things that are very important for us is always to respond to assalamu alaikum with something better or at least equal to it. Is that right? And if I remember right, the hadith it says that the Prophet وسلم, was sitting with some of his companions and somebody entered and he said, assalamu alaikum. And he said, this is one. And somebody else says, Salam alaikum rahmatullah. This is two. Yeah? And it said, Salam alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And that became three. So it's either 10, 20, 30, or 1, 2, 3, if my memory serves. You just want to be on TV, don't you? Alhamdulillah. Anyway, we can bring it back up, right? <laughs> anyway, Alhamdulillah. So, if somebody says salam alaikum to you, you got to say wa alaikum salam rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, or or at least equal or better. And what the ulama, the scholars, they said. So if somebody says salam alaikum, you should at least say salam alaikum rahmatullah. And if he says salam alaikum rahmatullah, then you got to say salam alaikum rahmatullah he will be careful. But don't go further than that because that's too much. Everybody got that? Okay, you're sure. Everybody understood this. Salam alaikum. Take it easy. Bunch of extremists, man. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi me. All of us are concerned, really, about what our purpose in life is. Every human being comes to this conclusion at some point that I need to find out why I'm here. What am I doing here? And because of that, every human being can communicate that subject with any other human being. I've worked in prisons around the globe. I've also had a chance to visit with people in their palaces, in their castles, and had a good chance to talk with people from all walks of life. I discovered that this really is the one topic that everybody would like to know about. This is a topic they want to know about. But I also discovered along the way that all human beings, they want one thing. One thing that everybody wants. And if I ask you right now, what do you think that every human being wants this one thing? What's the first thing that comes in your mind? If you said money, I promise you that's not the thing that everybody wants. Somebody laying in a hospital especially somebody that's near death. If you told them, you want money, they'd be like, who cares? I want my good health. I need my good health. And if you said, well, a beautiful woman, well, I definitely would agree from my standpoint, but that wouldn't be everybody. A woman wouldn't say she wanted a beautiful woman. Well, most of them. So, if you said, well, a beautiful mate, there are still people that that's not the number one thing in their life. The more you think about it, the more you realize that we really 
don't have a pat answer. Yet there is one common denominator. Because if I want money or fame or a beautiful spouse, a big house, I'm starting to make my stuff rhyme. I was listening to Mohammed Buna so much, you know what I'm saying? Buna Mohammed, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I can't help it, but make you want to rhyme. No matter what it is, though, that you want, it's because you have an ultimate, an ulterior motive behind it. If I had money, then I could do something, yeah? If I have a big house, then, if I have a good job, then, if I'm famous, then, we always have ulterior motive, because if I have if, 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 what? What is the thing that you're really working toward? We could ask a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor, somebody, and probably we would eventually get the right answer because they study that. What is the ulterior motive behind every human being? And actually there is one common denominator and we as Muslims should know it. This should be a part and parcel of the teaching that we're giving to ourselves, to our children, and even to the non-Muslims. Every human really wants what's called in the Arabic language, salam. And if you said, wait a minute, all I got to do is walk up to somebody and go, salam, and they're going to be okay? No, because it's not what I meant. I want you to first understand something about the word salam. We translate it into English as what? Everybody knows. What do we call it in English? By the way, I have a microphone and you don't, so I need to hear you. What do we translate salam into English? Exactly. Exactly wrong. <laughs> not because it's not peace, but because it's not enough. One of the names, Asma wa Safa, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as salam. Sa? Yes or no? Yes. It's one of Allah's names. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. And we say that after every salah. Yes. From you is coming this, and you are this. We're getting this from you. And the translation said, you are the peace, and from you comes peace. You know what the problem is? You need to have a more in-depth study of the root of the word and then the ramifications behind it. Because Allah is the epitome of every one of his attributes, asma wa safa. And in reality, and I got this from a very good scholar, he said in the Arabic language, it's difficult to translate this as one word, so most people are just copping out. They're just saying, peace, done. And in fact, it's much bigger. Security is there, salama, safety. Security is in this word. It's taslim, salaman, a salam, the salam. So along with this is coming the security, the safety. Then you find peace because you will not find peace until there is safety and security. Is that right? What kind of peace is it? You say, oh, I'm at peace, but there's rockets going off around you and guns going off and sirens going off and people running up and down and you said, okay, I'm at peace. No, you're not because you're insecure. You need security. And this is a part of salam. You need the safety and this is a part of salam. And then you have ah, peace. Oftentimes, in advertising, they show us a picture of an island 
with a big palm tree and the beach and the gentle water rolling up. And they advertise, you know, you're going to take a trip and relax and have peace. Have you seen these ads? You know what I'm talking about, yeah? You're like, ah, uh, wouldn't that be nice? I want to ask you a question. Have you ever really sat in one of those places for a long time? The sun's bearing down on you, right? Maybe bugs crawling around on you, flies everywhere, huh? And then there's those monkeys up there in the trees making all kinds of racket. Maybe a coconut falls on your head. And then about that water being so still and nice. The ocean? The ocean isn't always still and nice. And that beautiful blue sky, and you're telling me it doesn't ever rain? No storms ever come up? Hurricanes don't come up? So, yeah, it's an image. But is it realistic? And in the same way, life itself, there's an image that we like to portray, but is it realistic? So when we begin to talk to people about this subject, they begin to identify with this, this concept, this weird thing that I really want. What is it I want inside? Why do I strive so hard to get a good grade? Why am I working so hard overtime to make so much more money? Why do I need this big house? Why do I need to have this kind of car? Why? What is inside of me that is telling me I have to have it so that I'll be happy? Again, we go back and look at the media advertising, the stuff we see on television, the things that we hear on the radio, in the magazines, the newspapers, the billboards. All of these things have a similar pattern trying to tell us if you just had this one thing in your life, it would be beautiful. If you had the Ginsu knives in your kitchen, you would be one happy camper. Oh, yeah. And if you have this car wash thing, whoa, you can wash your car so fast. And we're all happy in the big smile. <laughs> Is it right? These are the ads. And you know, man, if I just have this kind of toothpaste, I'll be the happiest guy in the world. Is that what they tell you? And you buy the toothpaste, doesn't even taste good. What I'm trying to get across is a point that we have confused things in our lives with this media advertising. We've confused things in our lives, even with preachers, ministers, teachers, people around us trying to give us good information. They mean well, but do they really have the hawk? Do they really have the truth? Because if I'm telling you, you can buy this and you'll be happy, I'm deceiving myself and you at the same time. Because you can never tell somebody they'll be happy with whatever it is. You can't guarantee that. Because happiness is a state of mind, a state of heart. This is where you'll find this, not outside, inside. Now, don't confuse happiness with success. Success is an achievement level. You know, when they have the picture, looks like a thermometer, and you're raising funds, and you're going to get so much money, or you're building something in your company, and when you get to this level, you achieve level one, level two in education, level one, level two, level three, and you get up to the top level, and they give you a diploma. Oh, you made it. You're successful. But are you happy? For a little while, you feel something because you achieved this level. I made it. I got it. You walk across the stage, you know. Da, 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 da. You heard that, right? And they give you the diploma, and you get it, and you open it up. It has your name on it. They misspelled it, but it's okay. I got my diploma. Well, you know how Muslim names, they have a lot of fun with that. The problem, it doesn't last very long because you find out you had the same problems that you started with. The diploma didn't get it for you. The job that you wanted, you finally got the job, 
you got up in the ranks, you're now the manager, <laughs> but are you happy? No, but you succeeded. You got what you wanted, right? You wanted that, Allah gave it to you, but you're not happy. You want more. Some people want children. A lot of people want children. If I just had a child, I'd be happy. And they get a child. That's not the one I wanted. <laughs> this one. <laughs> just kidding. Maybe you want another one, and another one, and another one. Maybe you have five children, six children, eight, ten. Muslims on the, in the world, by the way, we have the most children, alhamdulillah. We do. Muslims have the most kids. But does it make you happy? Sometimes our sisters, by the way, are so busy taking care of kids, they don't have time to think about whether they're happy or not. But the fact is, happiness and success are not always the same thing. You can achieve a lot of goals, inshallah, by the permission of Allah. But will you be happy? And that's the same common denominator for every human being. The worst murderer that I met in prison, the best religious person that I ever met, the poorest man in the street and the richest man in all of Saudi Arabia, and the most powerful person on the planet, according to people anyway, all of them still have the same exact thing inside. They want salam. They want security. They want that safety they want that protection around them, and they want to find peace inside of that. The worst dictator in the world still wants his own peace, his own salam, his own security. Doesn't he have a bunch of security guys around him? Doesn't he? Yeah, why? Why does he need all these people around him? Because he's very insecure. So how... We get it down to this, how can I get this thing? And you can't. You can't get it unless As-Salam will grant it for you. As-Salam, like Hidayah, guidance, is not yours. It belongs to Allah, but he can give it to you. The creator, the sustainer of the universe is the one and only one that gives Hidayah guidance to people. Sa? True or false? True. Now imagine this is one of his names, Al Hadi. And another one of his names, attributes, characteristics, is As Salam security, safety, peace. And you're not going to get that unless he gives it to you. So the poorest man in the world could be very much in security and feel good, while the richest man in the world could be very insecure, no peace. Now do you understand from this little short introduction to the subject why even the richest people, the most famous people, the people that have the most things in this life still commit suicide? Have you ever wondered about it? Now you know. Have you ever wondered why somebody rich would still steal? Why would they do that? They already have everything. Why would they cheat? Why would they want to do that? Now you know. Now let's look at the other side. Why would somebody so poor, he only has one pair of shoes, the only pair of shoes he has in the world, and he's an old man, but he sees somebody else has no shoes and they're poor, and they're also in the same condition as him, and he takes his shoes off and gives it to this person, and he smiles. He smiles. Why? Why is it somebody could take 
food, the only food that they have, and give it to another person who's starving, and they can smile and say, sit down, sit down. Because they know inside that the only one who gives them their rizq is al-rizq. They know inside the only one who gives hidayah is al-hadi. They know inside that the one who is capable of giving the security, giving them the peace, is as Now you have a better situation. You've talked about this. You've shared this with other people now. Imagine. Then you can introduce one more word. We talked about salam. Salama, this is security and peace. Salam, yes. Also peace, but you didn't mention the security, the safety. Then you can talk about another word. All of these coming from the same root. The same root. Sin, lam, meme. Sium. From this, another word. Aslama. If you know Aslama, then you can begin to understand how you can achieve that level of as What is as In the English language, there's no word for it. We have to give you a combination of words. So bear with me while I share this with you. First of all, there is something we call in English, surrender. Okay? I want to give a demonstration of this. Put your hands up. I said, put your hands up. There you go. Way up. All right. Stretch them out like this. All right. Stand still. You ready for airport? Oh, yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> to surrender and do what somebody else wants you to do, and you have no objection whatsoever. You just do it. That's surrender. Second word, submission. And that means that I'm going to do it. Tell me to do it, I'll do it. Tell me don't do it, I won't do it. That's submission. Then the third word, obedience. It's related. These are related to each other. Obedience. It means to obey. There's a rule. You will obey it. The fourth word is sincerity. Again, this is all connection. The sincerity means that even if nobody's watching, you'll still obey the rule. You're out in the jungle. You're out in the desert. Somewhere nobody is out there. But the rule is the same, speed limit. So you obey the speed limit. You could go 100 miles an hour, no problem. But you said, no, speed limit, I'm gonna stay with the speed limit. And there's a stop sign, but I'm looking. <laughs> I don't see another car for 20 miles anywhere. Why would I have to stop? It's a rule, I'm gonna stop. This is sincerity. Then, peace. After I've done all of these things, I gave up myself. I surrendered myself. I'm obeying. I'm in complete submission. Whatever comes, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be sincere with it. Not 99%, 100%. Allah does not accept you to be 99% with him. Only 100%. That's it. All right, now comes salam, peace. But also security, also the safety. All this is coming in this one package, aslama. This is a verb, this is an action. This is what you do with your life, with your mind, with your heart. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace with Allah. He gives you an order to do something, you don't go, well, I don't think, I, I don't really understand that. Can we uh, examine that from a scientific point of view? What is the benefit of doing salah? I mean, is it like exercise? Am I going to feel better? When I put my head on the ground, I mean, do I really have to do that? I might get my head dirty. I mean, you know. What is the benefit of fasting? Maybe I could lose weight. Maybe I could, you know, fit in that <coughs> dress. It was a little bit tight. I could, you know. 
Because if I'm doing this, this is not for Allah. If I'm doing this, it's not for Islam. Why well, I'm doing it? Show it off. Maybe I do it because other people do it. If this is what I want, it's not Islam. Islama is the verb. Islam is the noun. By introducing this subject, watch how we did it. We started with what everybody wants. So you got everybody's attention. Then we explained it from the point of view of the inner psyche of the human being. And we found out that's true. That is what we want. And now how do we get it? To acknowledge, first and foremost, that you're not God. If you were God, then you would always have your peace with you. Because you could make your environment be what you want it to be. Is that right? But you don't have that ability. I don't have that ability. I cannot make anything. I can't. All I can do is hope that the Almighty will make things work out for me. Isn't that true? Isn't that how it works? Once we acknowledge this, then we begin to understand what Islam is for ourselves first and for others second. Whether it's your own family, your own children, your own distant family, your neighbors, people you work with, as much as you want to help other people, there's no benefit if you didn't help yourself first. Begin inside, internalize, look inside of yourself and ask yourself, do I really understand what I'm all about and how I can make it better? Allah tells us something in the Quran that we very often un misunderstand because we use terms the way other people tell us to look at it. I want you to think now with the new mind that you just inherited from Allah. He gave you this knowledge. You heard me say it, but he's the one that allowed me to speak and allowed you to hear it. Now, from what you just picked up, listen again to a translation of Quran when Allah tells you he does not change the condition of a people until the people change themselves. Doesn't that really mean inside of us we have to make the change? We're not talking about changing diapers on a baby here. We're not talking about changing clothes. We're not talking about changing jobs, changing career moves. We're talking about internalizing, changing the human being inside so that we can achieve what we really want in this life to get that real peace, that security, the safety of knowing no matter what happens, it's from Allah. Because part of that peace, I want you to think about this, part of the peace that we're talking about, I gave everything to Allah. Now, no matter what he gives me, I should say what? Alhamdulillah. Yes or no? Shouldn't I be pleased with what Allah gives me? If I truly believe in Allah and I believe that I've given him over my life, so whatever he wants for me, this is what I should want for myself, right? What if it's cancer? Somebody comes into Islam, it happened. One of the prisoners came into Islam, 28 years old, he got cancer, he died. Before he died, I interviewed him and talked with him for a little bit. He started crying. I said, why are you crying? He said, what do you mean? I said, why are you crying? He said, well, they told me I only have maybe a few days left to live. I said, you're actually very fortunate. You're lucky. He said, what? How? I said, the rest of us, we don't know that. We don't think about it. We think we're going to live forever. None of us in this room are really thinking I'm going to die tomorrow. Are we? Are you really thinking, that's it, I'm going to die tomorrow? No. Even if they told you that, you wouldn't believe it. But he had been told, and he could feel his body giving up. He knew inside he wasn't going to make it much longer. I said, so why are you crying? All of us will die. Kulu nafsan Are we all going to die, yes or no? Yeah. 
If you know that, what should be your job? To get ready for it. Is that right? You get ready for it. And then I told him, the good news is, in Islam, if you die of a disease, if you die from a headlong fall, if you die by drowning, if you die in childbirth for our sisters, if you die in these kind of circumstances, a very you know, powerful death like this, something amazing, Prophet Sallallahu guaranteed them, not just paradise, to be like the martyrs, the shuhada, in the Jannah. The brother said to me, really? I said, yeah, you got some very good news. If you're patient, you keep patient with the law. When you pass away, you'll be with the Mujahideen. He said, really? Yes. He became very happy. They say he died with a smile on his face because he understood this message. Total surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace with Allah. Then you'll have the peace here on earth. I'll end this by mentioning something our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told us. He used a term in the Arabic language, it means astonishing, ajib, ajiban. Amazing, astonishing is the condition of a true believer, a movement. Because only good comes their way. It's all good for them. The life is good for them, no matter what. It's good. If he gets the things that he wants in this life, he says, Alhamdulillah. He's thankful to Allah. And if he gets the difficulties, the fitna, the trials and tribulations that come with life, he makes sabr, he's patient, persevering, still in his heart, alhamdulillah, for whatever. And it's good for him. It's good for him, but it's only in the case of the true movement. So when you see our brothers and sisters suffering around the world, you should be striving and struggling your best to find ways to help them if you can, but at least making dua for them. But know this, if they're true believers, Allah will make everything secure for them. Regardless of what we see in this world, Allah is taking care of them. Even if they are bombed and killed, murdered, mutilated, all of the things, we hate that, and we should. We should, it's wrong. But know this, those believers are in a much better place than they ever were in this life. Because for the true believer, everything is good. Whether they get everything they want in this life and they say Alhamdulillah, or if they have difficulty, but they make patience. Finally, this one little piece of advice to myself more than anybody else. A story the Prophet Sallallahu told us. He said there's two people who come on the Day of Judgment, Yom Kiyama, two. One of them, he had everything in this life. Everything. Anything he wanted, Allah gave it to him. Even when he was going to die, Malakul Mot, the angel of death, came to take his ruh, take his soul. He said, wait, I want a feast. I want a big meal before I die. Okay, he got that. Then he died. The other person, he never got the things he wanted in this life. He wanted just this or some small, nope. Difficulty after difficulty, problem after problem. Even when he's going to die, Aunt Malakul Mo came for his ruh to take his life. He just wanted a drink of water. And he didn't even get that. Now these two come on the day of judgment. The one, the one who had nothing, had all the difficulties, he will be taken and pushed into the Jannah like you push a pin into something and pull it out. And he'll be asked, in your whole life, did you ever see any difficulty? He will say, no. In my whole life, I never saw any difficulty. 
because that one second in the Jannah wiped it all out. The other person, he had everything in this life, everything, but he'll be pushed into the Nari Jahannam, na'udhu billah. He'll be put in the hellfire like you put a pin in something and pull it out. A second, boop, boop. And he'll be asked, in your whole life, did you ever see anything good? He said, well, in my whole life, I never saw anything good. That one second from the hell wiped out any, any good that he saw in this whole life. Now, I won't leave you with that because the Prophet Islam didn't leave us with that. Some companions, they ask, wait a minute, we want to know how come a guy, he had everything and he went in the hellfire and another guy, he had nothing and he went in the Jannah. How does that work? Prophet Islam said something, I'll translate it to you in, in a quirky way in English, but it means nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. This is good news for us because we're not perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfectly good. Nobody's perfectly bad. The first man who had everything in this life, actually he was bad. Allah hated this man. He was so bad. But he wasn't perfectly bad. He did some good things. So Allah gave him all of his good in this life. So he will never taste or even smell the Jannah. The other man, actually, he was very good. A very good man, but he wasn't perfectly good. He made some mistakes. He did some bad things. So Allah gave him his punishment in this life. He suffered in this life, so he would not have to suffer in the next life. So he wouldn't even have to smell Jahannam, the hellfire. Now, does it make sense to you? You can see how we all fit much better now when you understand what the life is really about. Allah tells us in the Quran, this is ibtila. And ibtila, a test from Allah. A test. He asks us in Surah Ankabut, Chapter 29 of the Quran. Ahasib al nas. The meaning of it. He said, Do the human beings think that they will be left alone just because they said, We believe? And that they will not be tested? For sure, Allah will test them just like He tests the ones before. This is a test. And our Prophet ﷺ said that the Anbiya, the Prophets, are the ones who suffer the most. So don't think that suffering means Allah doesn't love you. In fact, it could be the very solution to all our problems. So I leave you with this one thought, that may Allah always keep us close to Him and give us the security, the safety, the peace, Salam. Salam alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.